Good morning, today we're gonna to be looking at putting together a timer for our code so we can actually identify how long it takes for algorithms to execute or for different parts of our program to be evaluated. And so to do that, first we wanna to put together a design for what we're gonna be using. And so we have right here in our UML, we have a model of what we're gonna be putting for this. As you can see, we have this inside our model package because this is gonna be something that will be owned by our controller, will be con defined by that, something we'll be using through a, a variety of products. So this is a some pre-built code we'll be using across a few different things. So it's gonna be our model package for this. We're calling it code timer because the code timer itself should reflect what it is and what it does, and so it's gonna be timing code. So our name reflects that as both what it is and does. We have in our data member section, we have a single data member for this. It's a type long. It's an execution time is what it named. So that's how long it takes for the actual code to be executed. So again, identifying what it is and what it does. Looking over our constructors and methods, we have a simple constructor for this, where we'll initialize that execution time to a nice default value. And then we have our standard uh, timer methods. We have like if you look on a stopwatch, start, stop, and reset. And then we have a couple of um, accessor methods we'll be using to retrieve information from that. The first one we have right here is our get execution time. We can simply just retrieve that value so we can actually use that information as needed. And finally, a two-string method, so we can have a quick way to export that information by simply calling the code timer object in any uh, various part of Java. And now we've looked at the design of that. We'll go ahead. We've got that saved. We can refer to back as needed. Let's go ahead and take a look at that in code. Looking over here in our code section, as you can see right here, we're inside our model package of this. We're going to be using this to time a recursion project for our first thing. And so we're in our CTEC model package. We have our public class code timer because we're defining a class. And so first we want to do is define in our data set, our declaration section, we define our data member. And again, we said that it was a private because our data members should be private to reflect that they have a um, level of abstraction and the fact that we have ownership of different code. Not everyone needs to be able to change that information. It simply needs to be able to be read. And so it's a private data member. It's of type long because we need to have something that can hold more than simply an int based on the amount of time that we're going to be dealing with. Since we're going to be measuring this in our nanoseconds, we need to be able to easily exceed 2 billion. Notice that we are using the camel case notation right here so we can separate that, make it easy to read. There are no parameters for our code, our code timer because it simply initializes a single value and then moves on from that point. And so we'll set that initialization and we'll set that equal to zero because the default value of our timer is zero time. And this way we can identify if we have not properly reset our timer or used it inappropriately. We can identify with it starting at zero. We've clearly not had the right amount of time happen. So we've got that done right there, saved and ready to go. Move on, we're gonna add a couple methods for this. These are all gonna be public methods again because these methods themselves will need to be called externally. And so we have that right there. So all the methods on this are public. And they're gonna be also actually just quick little one-liners that we're gonna use so we can have that method and use it as necessary inside our code. So our first one, public void. And we'll call it start timer. And for a start timer, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, sound it to the current time right now using the nanoseconds. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the execution time is going to be equal to system.nanotime. So right here, we've identified what um, the system's nanosecond count is right now, and we're going to assign it to execution time at this point. This gives us immediately a time that we can use as a base time from when we're starting our timing of different algorithms or of the execution of different sets of code. Again, go ahead and save. Again, the same basic rule applies. Every time you have a major save, you should also have a commit. And we'll look at that in just a second. Our next method we're going to have right here is the stop time. It's also public. It's also a void type. In our stop timer, what we need to do is we need to actually calculate that difference of time. To do that, what we are going to do is we're going to have the this.execution time be assigned the value of system.nanotime again minus the execution time. By doing it in this order, the system.nanotime minus execution time, we can guarantee that we will have a positive value for that difference of time. So we can actually have that measured so we can actually use that to say, oh, it's been this number of nanoseconds since that was executed. Because the nanotime doesn't guarantee a positive value for that, but we can have that but since it's going to occur after that, we'll have that number be able to have a difference to be shown. Then we're going to go ahead and go down and add our reset. And so a reset, we would call that after we're done with it before we time something else, because we will often be timing more than once within a program, so we want to have a bay ability to be reset, just like you do on a regular stopwatch. And so in this, it's also going to be a public method. It'll also be a void type, and again, keeping the idea of making our naming convention where it reflects what it is and what it does, we keep the very boring name of reset timer. 
And this one will be just like the constructor, where we're simply going to set the this.execution time back equal to zero. So now that we've got those four basic methods, or three basic methods, and our constructor taken care of, this is a great time to do a commit to our GitHub, because again, the idea within that is every time we have a major save, we want to make sure we have that change identified. And again, when to do that, we go up here in our version code inside our class documentation, and we can give this a quick little version update, saying this is now going to be version one. We made a specific change and we say a, a quick little message about that. This is also good to be using as our GitHub commit message. So we added the basic methods and the constructor. Again, giving the idea that we have a version information right there, the date itself, and a single English sentence that explains what we've done. So we've got those two basic components right there. The other two methods we need to add to that, if we go look back at our design really fast. The other two methods we have in our design, as you can see right here, we have our getter for the execution time. We'll simply return the value. And then we also have a toString method we can use to use it so we can have properly execute, so we can properly display information about this object when called within code. So the first thing we're gonna do is we wanna go ahead and just create our getter. Now we can use the shortcut method to do that. We can go right up here to execution time, right click on that, Go down here to source, and then from source go to generate getters and setters. We are only going to select the getter for the execution time on this, and we would just do that by choosing to select getters. If we were doing more than uh, one data member, we could also do that same thing right here. Now we want to make sure we do the insertion point. I'm adjusting this from simply being after the actual execution time. I'm going to put this down after the other methods have been called, so I'll have it after reset timer. And I'll just go ahead and generate the default method comments and say OK. As you can see right here, it returns the execution time, and I'm going to turn this into a more proper English sentence. Again, by taking the documentation comment so it adds a, a full English sentence attached to that, we can return the execution time value for the code timer object. It clearly explains to our users when we um, do our Java doc what is going to be returned by this value. Quick little method, no big deal for that. Our last method we need to make for this is our toString method. Two string methods, again, as you know, in Java, what we're um, called when we automatically dump a variable into the, a system.print or println, or when we simply try to um, achieve information for it as a value. And this allows us to simply get much more information than simply the at sign, the name of the class and package, and a bunch of gobbledygook that no one wants to see. So we're going to have that write this so we can actually use some information. So it always has to be public. It's always going to be of type string because that's what we use in Java. And it's going to be called two string. Now this method will be used quite often when we're doing things such as comparable. We want to actually make sure that we have a way of dealing with this. As you can see right here, we have a red underline of doom because we've not actually returned a variable for this or returned a value for this. Now we'll keep with our standard approach for this. We're going to declare a variable of the type of returning and return that value or that variable within our project. So the first thing we'll do is make a string variable and we'll call this timer description. So what I've got right now quickly is just that the current execution time is, and then a colon, and this dot execution time. So we can have it so we can clearly identify that what we are currently having inside that object is the execution time. And because we're gonna be using nano time, we're gonna add a little bit more information. Again, using the whole idea of using proper English language for this. So we have the current execution time is, and this dot execution time in nanoseconds. And so we can clearly identify that the execution time is in nanoseconds. We are identifying this to our user when they, this is displayed to them, that you can see identify how long the uh, method itself took for that to occur in nanoseconds available for us right there. So that toString method allows us to have a specific information that we can use to then display that to the user about that for programs so we can use this. Now, since this is inside our model package, we can easily have this dumped into a label or into a text field inside our GUI because the controller will own the instance of this and we can grab that information from that by simply just passing that information from the controller to the view.